Good morning and thank you for joining us today. We will begin the webinar in five minutes.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Powerful Business Writing. My name is Greg Farabee, and I am the Client Relations Manager for Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development. Our center specializes in providing employee development for clients in Northeast Ohio and around the country. We offer training as public open enrollment programs delivered in Independence, Ohio, as well as on-site customized programs delivered at your location. I'm joined today by Kent State Facilitator Marianne Canario. I will be serving as your host, and Marianne will be our presenter for today. Marianne founded her own business in Instructional Technologies in 1992 to improve business communications in English and Spanish. Canario holds a master's in international degree in business administration from Baldwin Wallace College and a bachelor's degree in Spanish from the College of Worcester. As you will soon learn, Marianne also specializes in written communication. Everyone in attendance today has been muted to avoid background noise from any of the over 240 registered participants. Despite having everyone on mute, we do encourage you to ask questions at any point during the hour. You can submit your questions in writing during, using the control panel on the right side of your screen. I will present your questions to Marianne as time permits throughout the webinar. Also on the right side of the screen is your opportunity to download the, the handout of the case studies. Marianne asks that you please download that. Uh, she will be referencing that during her presentation. We are recording today's webinar, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording after we conclude our time together. Without further ado, I will now pass the microphone to Marianne Canario. Thank you, Greg, and good morning to everybody on the call. Today, for the next hour, we'll be discussing some techniques on how you can write more powerful emails that can help you get, a, get your point across quickly and easily. Remember that your emails should take every opportunity to show how you add value to the processes at your company. Today we have three agenda topics, as you can see on this slide. First, we'll be spending a little time discussing how the purpose of your writing and knowing your audience will play into an effective message. We'll be talking about best practices for formatting your message, and then we'll move on to creating specific subject lines that can be useful to both you and to your readers. Many of you rely on others to be effective. You and the people that you rely on are really busy, and increasingly, day by day, you're getting more busy. It's important that you present your information in a way that is concise and clear and pointing out the value that you add at each step rather than sowing confusion and additional questions. By the end of this webinar, you will be able to say why you need to write a particular email, who it's directed to, and you will write clear, concise subject lines that jump off the screen for your readers. This calls their attention and it can get you quicker results. And your emails will have a professional format that reflects well on you and on your employer. So let's first focus on identifying your purpose and your audience. The purpose of your writing is very important, yet many of us just sit down and begin typing without really thinking about why we are writing. Would you chat in and let us know some purposes for some of the writing that you do? And I'll ask Greg to name some of those as they come in. For an example, I'll just get you started. Some of you write to inform. You write to give out information to let people know what's going on. What other kinds of purposes do you have? We have share company information request information, gather information, and general distribution of information. Okay. Some of you also, since you've asked questions, somebody has to answer those questions. So you may be on the answering side of the equation occasionally. I don't see anybody that answered to motivate or to convince others. 
This is something we don't think about. Unless we're in sales, we often don't consider that persuasion is a part of our job. But really, I want to suggest that it is a part of our job. It's a part of all of our jobs. Because if your writing is not persuasive, how are you going to get somebody to change a procedure that they've been doing? How are you going to get somebody to answer you quickly to choose your email over other emails in their inbox? Many of you probably have 50, 100 emails in your inbox every day. How are you going to decide which ones to answer first? So from the viewpoint of the author, a little persuasiveness is really helpful. I would like for people to see my emails and answer them before they answer the other 49 in their inbox this morning. There's one other thing that I just want to toss out there, and that is that the way that you approach your writing should change depending on what your purpose is. If you're just giving out information, your tone can be neutral and professional. On the other hand, as we alluded to a minute ago, if you're trying to get people to change their behavior, your language should be more persuasive. And this versatility makes you a stronger writer. Sometimes I talk to clients who believe that in order to be their genuine self, they should always write in the same manner. And while I can understand that perspective, I want to suggest that that's probably not the most effective way for you to approach your writing. So let's move on a bit and talk about the audience. Who do you write to? Would you chat in your audience? I'm going to just get you started here. Some of you write to customers. Some of you write to vendors. Yep, we have very similar responses, Marianne. Customers, administration, colleagues, uh, internal, external customers. Good. Colleagues is a very good one. And management. Some of you write to management. Some of you write to account reps. So now let's put yourself in your reader's shoes. Think about what your reader needs and wants. The purpose of your writing is not for you to document what you need. But if you're writing to somebody else, you really want to give them what they need. Certainly, there is a need for documentation. That is often a separate piece of communication. So we're going to try and do what the audience needs, not what you need in your writing. Why does it matter who will read what you write? I'll invite you to chat in and tell us why it matters. For example, different audiences have different needs. What about the vocabulary that you're going to use? Is that influenced by your audience? What about the amount of detail that you put in? Yeah, people are getting those, exactly. So it does make a huge difference who you're writing to. For example, if you are a computer person, an IT person, and you're writing to me, I am pretty proficient with technology. I can use my computer. I can use Office. I can get things done that I need to get done. I really am not so good at the back end of things. I am not so good at clearing out the cookies for my browser. I am not very good at doing updates and keeping my, my virus checker up to date. I rely on IT to do those things for me. Now, if they need my help, and if you're the IT person asking me to clear my cookies, if you send me an email and say, Marianne, please clear your cookies, what am I going to do? I'm either going to pick up the phone or I'm going to shoot you back an email saying, can you walk me through that because I can't do it. And this happened to me yesterday, in fact. This is a really current thing. I was having some technology issues, and I called the IT department, and they said, oh, it's probably just some cookies that are accumulated that are messing up your thing. Just clear out your cookies, and you'll be fine. They were ready to hang up, and I said, no, wait, wait, wait. Can you just tell me how to do that? Because I'm sure I should be clearing my cookies regularly, but I'm not. And 
it made a huge difference. And so the woman I was speaking to was very kind and patient. And she went step by step and told me how to do it. Sure enough, the performance of my computer improved immediately. This is why it matters to think about who's your audience. On the other hand, if you are writing to an IT person and you present them with minute details on how to clear their cookies from their browser, you're likely to be offensive because they know exactly how to do it. They don't want to feel talked down to and you may come across as condescending. How can you accommodate different audiences then in your writing? Because it would really be time prohibitive to write one email to the people who don't know how to clear cookies and a separate email to the people who do know how to clear cookies. Anybody have ideas for how you can write one document that would meet the needs of those two audiences? Would you chat in your answer? I'll give you an idea. Let's think about subtitles. Yeah, a couple of you got it. So when you have different audiences, the best way to do that is to use a subtitle. For example, the subtitle could be clear out the cookies in your browser for better system performance. Underneath that subtitle, you could put the steps of how to do that, and you would put a numbered list. Number one, go to the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of Chrome. Number two, do this. Number three, do that. If you are sending your document to an IT person, that person is free to read the subtitle and say, oh, clear the, brow the cookie browser. I know how to do that. Okay. They don't have to read the part underneath that. If you send it to me, that tells me the general goal to clear the cookies, and then it tells me step-by-step step how to go through that. That's very helpful to both audiences. One of the really good techniques about business writing generally, and email writing in particular, is that the more you can leave control in the hands of your audience in terms of skipping around the document, in terms of just not reading portions of the document, the more you will endear yourselves to them because it doesn't take so much of their time. All right, let's go on. This screen shows you three different types of audiences that I find helpful in talking about an audience. This moves the focus a little bit away from people's roles, management, coworker, vendor, customer, and it puts the emphasis a little bit more on people's emotions, on motivating them to do what you need them to do, whether that is to simply read your document and find out new information, or whether that is to do something for you to answer your questions or to get you certain information. I think of my audience in three different categories. The first guy on the left, you may recognize him. You may feel like that on occasion. He says, why should I read this? Every time I get something from Marianne, it's confusing. I have to read several paragraphs before she gets to the point. I don't know what she wants. This wastes my time. I have so much stuff to do, and here's Marianne's document, and routinely she wastes my time. That's one type of an audience that we might encounter. This person is very frustrated. Whatever you can do to relieve that frustration will be good. The young man in the middle has a different need. He says, what's in it for me? He wonders why he should take his time, and he certainly hopes that I can show him how my message can make his work easier or faster or maybe more efficient. If none of these apply, then as a last resort, he hopes how I, that I can show him how my message can improve the, the situation for the company or for his customer. The young woman on the right is also very busy. She 
believes that collaboration is important in the work fa- workplace, and she's willing to answer questions or do whatever she can to help me. But she sure hopes that I can say it quickly, that I can show her immediately what I need her to do so she can help me, and then she'll go back to her own work. Let's let's profile some of these different needs. Let's imagine that you're sending management a description of a revised procedure for a common process. What does gen- management generally want in this situation? I'm going to ask those of you who sometimes write to management to chat in and tell us what kinds of things is management looking for. Yes. You're right. Management is not looking for detailed information on how to do the process. As a general rule, management is looking for information on costs and benefits. They're looking for information about how they can increase efficiency. Sometimes they're looking for information about making future decisions. Now, let's think about this same communication or the same task that you have to describe how a process changes. If you're writing to your coworkers and you're actually sending them a revised procedure for something that they need to do, how will the amount of detail that you give your coworkers differ from what you send to management about the same process? Yeah, a couple of you are pretty quick here. Manage, or your coworkers need you to be more detailed. They need it to be well organized, not so global a perspective, but really more down, right, right down on the ground. What do I need to do? How do I have to do it? What are the steps in this process? So management is involved in a more global perspective. They want to know how can they use this revised process going forward to make things better for the company as a whole, while your coworkers want to know Tell me the steps to get through the process in the, on the computer. What should I click? What do I do now? What information should I have at hand before I begin this process? This versatility in your writing is something that will be really worthwhile for you. It helps you to build a reputation as somebody who really adds value and somebody who doesn't waste their time. The benefit for you is that as your reputation grows, that you are clear, that you give only the required information and not a lot of extra fluff, not a lot of meandering around the topic, people will often respond to you more quickly, and that's a great benefit for you. And I will just invite you at any time, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to use your chat feature and send them to us and we'll address them throughout the hour. All right, let's talk about formatting your email. The new, the newer version of formatting is to use block paragraphs. Occasionally I see people who indent five spaces and then they write their paragraph and the next paragraph starts immediately on the next line and indents five spaces. That's kind of an older style. It's not that it's wrong, but now more and more we're seeing block paragraphs. A block paragraph starts at the margin, and every line is left justified to the left-hand margin. Then at the end of your paragraph, there is one whole blank line. And then the next paragraph starts at the left-hand margin, and again is left justified all to the left-hand margin. This helps people to see at a glance kind of the structure of your writing and adds a little white space, which really helps a lot, especially on the computer. So where we didn't need so much white space on paper, now that we're using computer screens, that white space really is valuable to us. Towards the bottom of this slide, I have Bueno, well, my my pet peeves here. First of all, avoid multiple punctuation marks. See the three dots there? People tend to think that the three dots is a way to be friendlier in their writing or to seem more accessible or more conversational. Actually, it doesn't do that. 
I am going to recommend that you get one punctuation mark. Choose any one you want, whichever fits your circumstance, but just limit yourself to one at a time. When you come to the end of a sentence, put a period, but just one, and then go on to your next paragraph, to your next sentence. If you need to emphasize your your points, please use bullets and white space. I've seen all kinds of tricks for formatting for trying to draw attention to certain points. I've seen documents that come in six different fonts. So they'll be, the general paragraph will be at 12 points, and then they have an important point, and they'll try and make that 16 points. Um, use white space, use bullets, limit the number of font sizes to just one. Use your whatever font size you're using, and think about other ways that you can emphasize your information. I have a question, Marianne, uh, just to clarify. Would 1.5 or double space be most appropriate? A lot depends on your audience and on the purpose of your document. When I do drafts for my own use, I usually double space them because it's easier for me to see it and kind of think about it. In general business writing, you should be single spacing. And that's why the block format is helpful because you're going to single space your paragraph, move it all left justified to the left-hand margin, and then put just one blank space so that when you go on to your next paragraph, it's going to be left justified at the left margin and everything at the left margin. Um, that way, you, you single space and you add a little white space in between. Okay. If that wasn't quite clear, the person who asked the question could write back with a further question if they need more clarification. One other thing I will say is that you need a comma after the greeting and after the closing. And be sure to put your name under the closing. For example, if I say... Thank you, comma, Marianne, all on one line. That means that I am thanking somebody else named Marianne. I'm not taking credit as the author of that, of that writing. So make sure that you put, if it's my own writing, I'll write thank you, comma, with a small Y, by the way. And then underneath the thank is where I'll put Marianne. That way we're clear that I'm the author and I'm not thanking someone else called Marianne. Let's go on for a minute. Oh, I, I'm very tricky here with my slide. This one says connect to your reader and tell why you're writing. Make sure each line starts at the margin. Don't hit enter at the end of every line. Only hit enter at the end of the paragraph. And actually, you're going to hit enter twice. And that's what's going to give you your nice white space. When you hit enter at the end of every line, that creates an awkward view on the receiver's computer. What happens is that you don't know how big of a screen your reader is using. When you hit enter at the, every line, at the end of every line on your screen, that may not be the end of every line on my screen, and that presents a very unprofessional image. If I'm using a screen that's a different size than yours, I'm either going to have really awkward breaks right in the middle of the sentence or it's going to look odd because every line will be on its own line. Every sentence will be on its own line. Only hit enter at the end of the paragraph. That way, no matter what kind of a monitor the other person is using, it'll line up properly. It'll look like a full paragraph. And again, you're going to leave one blank row. This next slide shows a sample of, of an email. We're going to start by saying, hi, Joe, and put a comma after Joe's name. You can see that I've written this in block paragraphs. After, hi, Joe, I leave one blank line. I'm going to put one or two sentences of connection and relationship building. Notice I said one or two sentences, not three paragraphs. So just a very quick thing. This is especially important when you are writing to a customer or if you are writing internationally. There are many countries that really value relationships over tasks. For example, if you are writing to the Far East, if you're writing to Latin America, 
those regions really like to know that they're dealing with a person and not with a computer. So those one to two sentences of connection really can make a difference there. Skip a blank line and then write the body of your email in black paragraphs starting at the left-hand margin. Leave a blank space between your paragraphs. And when you finish your email, put some sort of a closing. You might say, have a great weekend. You might say, enjoy your vacation. Perhaps you say, thank you. You might say, regards, if you're writing to a customer or a vendor. And whether or not you put a comma or a period depends on whether you have a full sentence or if it's just a little phrase. Notice that in your closing, the only letter that's capitalized is the first letter. So if you write thank you, you have a capital T, a lowercase y. If you write best regards, you have a capital B and a lowercase r. And your name goes underneath your closing. What I have not shown you on this chart is that underneath whatever you want people to call you, Marianne in my case, comes your email signature. That would typically have your full name, and it would have your role in the organization so that I can identify who I am corresponding with. And then the company name and address and phone number and whatever contact information you want for the reader to contact you. For example, in my email signature, I do not put my cell number. That's my personal choice because as a consultant, I drive a lot to my customer sites. I do not want to try and have a professional business conversation on the phone while I'm driving down I-480. Therefore, I don't give out my cell number typically. If I want to have a professional conversation with you, I much prefer that it occur in my office without distractions where I can give you 100% of my attention, not driving down the freeway worried about the guy who's weaving in and out of the lanes in front of me. So this is your personal decision or perhaps your company preference. What goes in your email signature? But you do need an email signature of some type. All right. Does anybody have questions on email formatting? No. Okay. It looks good, so we'll go on. We're moving on to subject lines here. And I have a question for you that I'd like you to chat in what you think. What does a concise subject line do for you as the author? Anybody have ideas? Yeah, some of you do. It keeps you focused. As you write your communication, if you start by writing the concise subject line, it reminds you to stick to the topic, not to meander around, not to have four paragraphs about your recent vacation, but to stick to the topic. I have a related question. What does a concise subject line do for your reader? Feel free to chat in your, your suggestions. Yes, that's exactly true. A concise subject line really helps your reader in many ways. Primarily, it gives them a hint about what's the topic of this email. When you're, that subject line comes up in an inbox, let's imagine that your reader has 50 emails. How does your reader decide to go through those 50 emails? One good way, of course, is chronologically. Perhaps they start with the email that came in first and just go chronologically through. That's probably not the best way to do it. Some of those emails may be important or critical or have a time limit. Others of those emails may be more informative so that if you're telling me about, I don't know, let's just say the company picnic, which is happening in a couple of weeks, it's not critical that I read that this morning. If I read that later this afternoon, that's perfectly fine. On the other hand, if Greg is waiting for me to get back to him with a question before he can continue with his work about a certain project, that would be more important for me to answer first. So a subject line really helps the reader to organize their day. It gives a clue about the content of that email. It gives a clue about how important it is, how urgent it is. 
And the more that you can help the reader to have some inkling about what is in that email, the more likely it is that when you have something really important, yours will pop up first in their line of work. So this is a really good thing. Let's try this. Greg is going to bring up a poll in just a minute. When you see the polling box, it's a pink box that popped up. Would you please click on your choice? The question is, must every email have a subject line? And your choices are yes or no. Would you vote for your choice? Looks like it's overwhelmingly yes. That's exactly right. Yes, every single email must have a subject line. That is so annoying. When I get emails that don't have a subject line, my first thought is, this is spam. And therefore, I often don't answer those emails. And in the worst case, based on who the author is of that email, I may or may not give it some priority, but typically that would land way down towards the bottom of my to-do list. This next slide shows you some sample subject lines. Now, in this case, it looks like I'm checking my emails on my cell phone, and these are some, some subject lines. Notice that some of those subject lines appear to be truncated. Of course they do, because my cell phone, even though I have a smartphone, is really not as big as my computer monitor. Some of those subject lines are cut off. Let's look at those subject lines, and let's see which ones grab your attention. Promotional items, attached new features, first quarter results, confirmed vendor visit, follow-up, product launch lines. Would you chat in, which of these subject lines grab your attention? Which ones jump off the screen at you? Yes, the ones that the ones that have capital letters tend to jump off the screen at you. This is a, a fairly new feature of subject lines, and it's one that I use very often. Here's the next question I have for you. Which subject lines answer the question, yeah, but what about it? So here's what I mean. Let's take the first one, promotional items. When I get that in my inbox, I'm going to say, yeah, but what about promotional items? Are they back ordered? Have they been received? Are they in the supply closet? Can I take one? Can I not take one? What about promotional items? To me, that subject line is not sufficiently clear. The next one says attach new features, and it goes on but it was cut off. So I'm not sure new features about what, but I do know there's a document attached. Now, people will say, there's no need to type in the word attached because when you have an attachment, there's a paperclip there. Okay, that's true. But let me tell you what some of those attachments are. When there's a paperclip, a lot of times I open up that attachment to see what it is, and it's the company logo. I don't need to know the company logo of the person who writes to me. That does not add to my understanding of the issue at all. A lot of times what's attached is sometimes I get a picture of their business card. I don't need a picture of their business card. I use the word attached to mean there's a document attached. It's not my company logo. It's not the graphic of the 25 years in business congratulations. It's not the graphic of the we have a new address. What concerns me in terms of an attachment is a document that I need to look at. That's where the typed word attached comes in. Okay, next one, first quarter results. Okay, what's missing from this subject line? Anybody want to chant it, chat in and tell me what's missing? Yes, how about the year? These things live on in perpetuity. 
If you go through your your email, I would bet that in your inbox, you have some messages from a few years ago. What's missing here is a year. How about first quarter 2018 results? Or even better, what about 2018 first quarter results? That way you can easily identify what that is. The next one, confirmed vendor visit. Confirmed tells me that I already have the details about the visit. You're just confirming. That way I don't need to worry about opening up this email immediately because I have an idea what's there. Activity report. Is that clear and concise? No. Some of you are on the ball and you're sending in chats quickly. Thank you. No, activity report is not clear. Activity about what? For what period of time? The more precise you can make your subject line, the better, because then you're assured, first of all, that I'm going to give it the attention it deserves. And in terms of your own record keeping, you can find that email again if you need to. Activity report. I'm willing to bet that you're working on several projects right now as we speak. Wouldn't it be helpful to know which project this activity is referring to? That way you can find that again. A big part of the problem with emails is that we send them out and we're thinking about the project at the moment now when we write the emails back and forth. But next week, our attention is on something else. And if we ever need to find that email from today and we have a very vague subject line, our chance of finding that is really not very high. So I encourage you to be as precise as you can about what it is. The next one, please review the attached reply by. This one I love. Look at the deadline right in the subject line. That will help me to organize my time. If you want me to reply by tomorrow, then I know I have to look at that today. The next one, congratulations. Yeah, you know, really, I may not look at that today depending on how my day goes. But if I'm really busy and you're only sending congratulations, that can wait. That's not critical. How about the next one? One more thing. One of my very favorite email subject lines, one more thing. I'm not going to ask you to chat back and acknowledge this, but let me just ask you, have you sent out emails with that subject line? I'm going to guess that most of us have. Please delete that from your subject line repertoire. That's not not really useful. And email class similarly is not useful. Okay. If you generally write good, solid subject lines, then give yourself a high five by putting your hand right up there on the screen for the Internet high five. And if you generally need improvement on that, then, of course, don't give yourself a high five. We'll move on and we'll see some guidelines for subject lines. Notice here, precise and accurate for this current message. Now, we all know that in the course of going back and forth, if Greg and I are sending an email back and forth, over the course of a few days, our subject, our topic of that email may change. We may veer into another topic that may or may not be related to this. Please look at your subject line and see, is it really valid for the current message that, that is the top message in that chain? Is your subject line compelling? Compelling means grabs your attention, jumps off the screen, says, read me, read me now, now, not next week, not tomorrow, but read me today, now. If there's anything urgent about your message, I like to actually type in that word urgent. Why don't I use the little exclamation point? It's the story of the boy who called wolf, right? We all know people who believe that their work is always urgent. Their work is more important than anybody else's work. And every email they send out has that little exclamation point. How do you react to those people? When you see that email come in with the exclamation point, don't you say, that darn Nelson, everything he sends is always urgent. Well, I've got news for him. His work is not as urgent as mine. I have a really important client, uh, a really important project I'm working on today. In order to avoid that whole thing, rather than use the exclamation point, which actually these days I never use, now I type in urgent right at the beginning of the, of the subject line. 
I think that if I take the extra 30 seconds to type in urgent, people understand correctly that it really is urgent and that I'm not perceived as crying wolf and people do respond really quickly. Don't be afraid to put your due date in your subject line. I do that, especially if it's a really short time frame in which I need a response. I don't want to bury that due date. I want to be really upfront. If I need something from Greg, hopefully by today, I put that due date in that subject line. And then Greg knows that I re- he really needs to look at that as soon as possible. Now, I will caution you, don't abuse that. This goes back to crying wolf again. If every email I send to Greg has the due date of today, Greg's going to say, well, you know, that Marianne, no, I'm not going to get back to her today. Or I'm out of the office with a client. I'm not going to worry about it. So I've alluded to this. You've seen examples of this. The new best practice is to summarize in a single word. Let's see how that looks. You can type in request. But don't stop there. Go on with what would have been your regular subject line or questions, and then go on with what you would have said ordinarily for your subject line. Second request is something I really like. When I send out an email, and I'm just going to beat on Greg here since he's conveniently handy and willing. Um, I've sent an email to Greg and I've asked him for something and he didn't respond. I have a couple ways I can I can go on from there, right? I can say, that Greg, he never responds. He's not responsive. He's not helpful. I can copy his manager. Let's get her in on this case. And then he, he'll get back to me if, if he has his manager on his case. I don't recommend that. I'm going to say, let's give Greg the benefit of the doubt. How do I know that he's not out of the office, out sick? How do I know that he's not been called into an urgent meeting? He intended to be in his office this morning, but there was a webinar and somebody else was intended to be the host, but that person called in sick. Now Greg's got a pinch hit. Let's give Greg the benefit of the doubt. If he hasn't responded, I can send him the identical email and I put second request at the front of that subject line. That does a couple of things. First of all, it tells Greg, I'm not going to go over your head to your boss at this first instance that you're not responsive. I'm going to allow for the fact that this fell between the cracks, that you fully intended to respond, but all of a sudden you had to pinch hit in this webinar and it threw your whole day off. And so some things are going to have to wait that you intended to handle promptly. This gives him the benefit of the doubt. And what happens typically is when I send something that's called second request, I get an answer in about five seconds because the, Greg is embarrassed. He said, oh, darn, I meant to respond to Marianne. I never intended to let this go unanswered. Let me get that to her right away. I have excellent results when I use second request without the need to put anybody's manager there, without the need to get Greg in trouble. And it's just a little kinder. I believe that in today's world, kindness is sorely lacking. Please, rather than copy the manager at the first opportunity, let's just give somebody the benefit of the doubt. This is a good way to remind them. If second request sounds a little harsh to you, what if you put reminder? Something to just jog their memory and allow them to say, oh, I, you know, I, I didn't intend to be unresponsive. Marianne, we've had several questions around the topic of using all caps. What a good question. Thank you. All caps is a really bad thing to use in the body of your email. It's perceived as shouting and or that you're too lazy to put the caps, the shift key on and take the shift key off. All caps in the body is really, really bad. All caps as one word in your subject line with the whole rest in lowercase letters is fine. And let me just back up a second. Let me go back to my picture of the cell phone screen. Look at that cell phone. Can you see how the all cap words jump out? When we write a subject line, we can't format that subject line any more than putting capital letters. We can't bold it. We can't italics. We can't make it a different font size. Really, the only feature we have for formatting a subject line 
is to choose all caps, one capital letter and the rest small, like first quarter results, or capitalize each line like promotional items. So let's look at those first three subject lines. The first one where we capitalized each word, the second where we have attached all in capitals and then we went on with lowercase letters, and the third where we have capital F and the rest all lowercase. Which one of those three jumps off the screen at you? I'm willing to bet it's the second one. So it's not all capitals, it's one word or two words only in the subject line, okay? Give it a try and see what kind of results you get. Or try some of these and then ask somebody the next time you see them in the hall, what did you think of that subject line? Get some input. And if people don't like it, you can go back to how you were previously doing it, but my guess is they're going to like it. What I don't want you to do is to put one word like request and nothing else in your subject line. So the idea is to say, what about it? So the capital letter word is the one that says, what about it? And then go on with what you would have used ordinarily. So let's just say, I'm going to write an email to Greg, and it's going to be about today's webinar. And I'm, I was working on this oh, a couple days ago, let's just say. Instead of sending him an email with a subject line that says, Friday's webinar, that's not precise. What if I were to write a subject line that said, questions hyphen Friday's webinar? That does a couple of things. First of all, it tells Greg, this is something I have to respond to prior to Friday because Marianne has questions and I want to be sure she gets her questions answered as she prepares and puts the final touches on this webinar. Secondly, it lets him know that he can't just let it go and think, oh, I'll see her Friday morning. We'll talk about it then. So the idea of this one or two words in capital letters says, what about it? And I find this really useful. Note that your capitalized word can be followed by a hyphen or a colon. I don't really care. Whichever one is easier for you is good. Let's go on and try this. At this time, you're going to use the samples that you got from the Word document that we posted at the front of the webinar. And we're going to look at sample A. Now, in order to do this, you're going to have to skim the email because you need to see what it's about. We are only looking at subject lines. We are not going to edit anything else on that email. Okay, let's do this. We're going to do this really quickly here. Here's the poll. When you see the polling box, please click on your choice. Is this a good subject line? Our subject is Buffalo. Now, take a minute, read that email. It's all on the screen, or you can read it on your Word document as you prefer. Do you like Buffalo as a subject line, yes or no? Answers are coming in. We'll give you just a second. It looks like we're, again, going to be very overwhelmingly one way or the other, and this time it is no. All right, that's perfect, yes. This is not about Buffalo. This is about delivering and picking up today. So that's actually not even the subject of this email. So I'm going to urge you to not go with your first instinct, but really say, what about it? It's not about Buffalo. It's about the blizzard in Buffalo. All right. We're going to try this one. This one does not have a subject line. We're going to look at sample C here. I'll give you a minute to read this, and then I would like you to chat in what do you think would make a good subject line. And as soon as you have a good subject line, go ahead and chat, chat this in. This whole email is a little bit longer. It doesn't all fit on the screen. So I will suggest that you read it from your case study book. What, what would be a good subject line? All 
Okay. Uh, we're reading here. This is a little bit longer. Good. All right. So let me, we have some answers here. Okay, what is this really about? So here's some sample subject lines you could use. Expectations for Friday's call. You could say pre-work for Friday's call. Okay, give us just a second. We have a little technical difficulty here. Okay, I just wanted you to have some practice reading an email and determining what it's about. So once again, this is about expectations for Friday's call. You want to be sure to use a subject line that implies that there's a deadline, that they have to be prepared for the call Friday afternoon. You don't want people to call in Friday afternoon and say, oh, what is it we're supposed to do? If we're going to have a discussion, then there's some things that you need to do. You might use a subject line, something like um, deliverables, hyphen, Friday's conference call. You might say um, input required, Friday's, Friday's conference call. Do something to show people that they have to take some action. You can refer to the sub to the the action item in your subject line. Okay, now that we've tried looking at a subject line to see if it's good and creating a subject line, we are ready to conclude. I have given you a couple of extra case studies, another one for you to say whether the subject line is good or bad, and another one for which to create a subject line, and I'll leave you to do that at the completion of our call so that you have some practice with these. Okay. So in the last hour, we have discussed three agenda items. We mentioned that considering your purpose and audience will help you to provide exactly the right amount of information that your audience needs and in a format that makes sense to them. Again, you are not writing for yourself. Try and put yourself in your reader's shoes. It's not good enough if you understand what you're trying to say. Your audience has to understand what you're trying to say. Secondly, we talked about formatting. We talked about the greeting and the closing. We talked about connecting to the reader and doing a little bit of relationship building. And we talked about the auto signature. Um, instead of an appendix, I will refer you to your company style guide. Most of my clients have requirements for what is to be in that auto signature. So rather than tell you what I recommend, I will leave that up to you to investigate at your company. And thirdly, we went on to discuss subject lines. Remember that every, every email needs a subject line. Take a few seconds to consider which subject line is most descriptive of your message. We're really excited about helping you to write better quality emails in a shorter time so that you can go back to your real work, which is serving your internal and external customers. At this point, I'm going to send you back to Greg. Who Thank you, everyone, and I apologize for a slight uh, <clears throat> technical difficulty there with the last poll. It stayed on your screen, and we had a little trouble getting it to disappear for you. So I uh, want to thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we, if you'd like to take a deeper dive into business writing, we encourage you to register for Marianne's public program on October 23rd at the Educational Service Center in Independence, Ohio. You can see the registration link on your screen. 
We also encourage you to register for our next webinar, Turning Conflict into Collaboration with Kent State Facilitator Ned Parks at 2 p.m. on Monday, September 17th. If you'd like to learn more about Powerful Business Writing or any of the programs that our center offers, please contact us at 330-672-3416 or email your training partner at kent.edu. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.